Good evening, Calvary Chapel Northwest. Like crew tonight, Lord, uh, but we're we're thankful the Lord will always meet us here, um, and we just praise Him for that. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll worship together. Father, we thank you for this night as we continue our study uh, in the Old Testament of Genesis. Lord, we go back to the beginning, and we just ask for your revelation tonight that you would just speak to us, that our hearts be ready to receive from you and what you have in store to teach us. Uh, we submit that to you, Jesus, and this offering of worship in your name. Amen. Let's stand and praise the Lord together.
is where I lay it down Every burden, every crown This is my surrender This is my surrender Here is where I lay it down Every lie and every doubt This is my surrender And I will make room for you To do whatever you want to To do whatever you want to And I will make room
Father, we thank you for just how much you love us, Father, that you first loved us, and we thank you for that, Lord. You chose us out of the darkness, Lord. You chose to send your Son to redeem us. We praise you for what you've done for us, Father. And as we submit our hearts and minds to your study this evening, Father, just speak through us. Grow us in our understanding of your word, Lord, so that we can increase our faith and share it with those that need it so much. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Welcome everyone to Calvary Chapel Northwest Wednesday night Bible study. That song says, oh, how he loves us. And I was just thinking as that song was playing as I was worshiping, I was thinking about my wife, you know. Sometimes I look at her and I'm like, oh, she's so beautiful and smart and compassionate and, you know, does she really love me? How can she love me? Right? And you probably feel the same way about your spouses. But tonight we're going to look at God. We're going to look at awesome, almighty God in his splendor. And then you will really think in your heart, how can he love me? And he does. He loves us so much. Tonight... We are continuing our second study through the book of Genesis. And our text for tonight is Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through 23. So if you would turn there in your Bibles, you can follow along with me as I read that passage. Genesis 1, 1 through 23. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons, and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence with us here this evening. Lord, we are so 
excited to be in your presence. Open your word, Lord, and behold wondrous things from your law. Gracious God, I offer myself as your servant. Use me, Lord God. Use my voice. Use the things that you have laid on my heart, dear God, to communicate your message to your people. Lord, if there's any in this sanctuary, which I doubt that there is, I know everyone here, or anyone listening online that does not know you, Lord, may your word penetrate their heart, open up their eyes, take off the blinders in the darkness so they can see you and come into a relationship with you. And for those that know you, Lord God, may we all be drawn into a closer, more intimate walk with you. We ask this in the power and authority of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Our text begins in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. If you were here for last week's study, or if you listened to the study online, you realize that we covered verse 1 and only verse 1 last week. This week, we will start again with verse 1. So there may be some overlap. There may be some review, but that's okay. Because verse 1 is just that important. It has been said, and I fully agree, that if you can believe the first verse of the Bible, verse 1 of Genesis, it's easy to believe the rest of God's word. See, the first verse of the Bible establishes the eternality of God. In the beginning, God was there. He was already there before time, before space. At the beginning of time and space, God, Psalms 93 verse 2, says your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. Everlasting certainly precedes the beginning. Not only was God there in what we call the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God is the source of all things. The ancient Hebrew word translated to create is bar. It means to create out of nothing. Our God demonstrates infinite power, creating something out of nothing. God's mind is infinitely intelligent and creative to design all that he had with such intricate detail. God demonstrates infinite power creating something out of nothing. If we can accept this first verse of the Bible which tells us of our God who created heaven and earth out of nothing, then it is easy to believe that God is able to do all that the Bible says that he has done and that he continues to do. Hebrews 11:6 says, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Verse 2. The earth was without form and void. There are some Christians that advance a theory based on this verse called the gap theory, which states that there is a gap of indeterminate time between verse 1 and verse 2. I confess, I used to believe the gap theory myself. No longer. This theory says that the heavens and the earth was created pristine, and then it was destroyed by the fall of Satan. And that the account of Genesis is that of a recreation, if you will. Uh, they use Isaiah 45, 18 for support to gain traction for this theory. Isaiah 45, 18 says, For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God who formed the earth and made it, who has established it? 
who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. The Hebrew word for void in Genesis and vain in Isaiah is the same word. So they conclude then that the world became void and that it was not created that way. But that's all they have. I reject that theory on several grounds. First of all, there's no scriptural evidence to support that Satan's fall destroyed the earth, making the account in Genesis a recreation. The book is titled Genesis, which means beginning. It's not titled Regenesis. Furthermore, I dismiss the use of Isaiah 45, 18. The without form and void spoken of in Genesis is simply the start of God's creation. Imagine a potter who can speak clay into existence out of nothing, and then he begins to form it. That is the void and without form. It's just the beginning of God's creation. We have a detailed account of six days of God creating. So God did a lot of forming. I also reject the gap theory because I believe that it is a weak attempt to accommodate the theories of science to explain an old earth. It's dangerous when you seek to take the theories of man and impose them on the word of God. We should not look at God's word through the lens of this world. We should look at this world through the lens of God's word. Man estimates or the estimates of man of how old this earth is really has no significance to me at all. And I will tell you why. On the day that Adam was created, and I know we haven't gotten to Adam yet, but, but bear with me. I don't think mentioning Adam is a spoiler. I'm pretty sure all of you know that Adam was created. So I digress. Anyway, on the day that Adam was created, Adam was a grown man. God created Adam as a grown man. Adam wasn't a little boy. Adam wasn't a baby. Adam was grown. If there was a scientific test, and there isn't, that could determine a person's exact age, and Adam was examined on the very first day that he came into being, that test would determine that Adam had years of maturity behind him when, in fact, Adam would have existed for less than a day. The same thing is true of the trees. God created grown trees. And on the very day that they came into being, if you were to test their age, science is certainly capable to do that, by cutting the trunk and examining the rings, they would find old trees, which in actuality, those trees had only existed for less than a day. The same is true with animals. God created the animals as adults, ready to reproduce. So... If you would like an answer to the age-old question, what came first, the chicken or the egg, I will gladly answer that question for you. It's the chicken. Not only the chicken, but the chicken and the rooster, because both are needed to procreate. And by the way, I'm sure that most of you know this, and this has absolutely nothing to do with our Bible study, minor detour. But if anyone were wondering or even think about stuff like this, when you eat your eggs, you are not eating aborted baby chicks. Just like human females who produce eggs all the time until they run out of eggs at menopause, chickens produce unfertilized eggs and then lay them. Unfertilized, that means there's no rooster involved. These eggs would never have become a baby chick. So, a little bit of useless information for you. Back to my point. God created a grown man. Grown trees and grown animals 
all showing signs of age at their inception. Why couldn't or wouldn't God create a fully formed earth? On top of that, there's the cataclysmic displacement and unsettling of the earth from the deluge. That is the worldwide flood that we will study in Genesis chapter 6. All of this gives the earth the age that it appears to have. Continuing in verse 2. And darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The Holy Spirit is introduced here at the beginning with God because he himself is God. God begins to reveal himself as one God manifested in more than one person. I didn't say God manifested himself as one God in three persons because the doctrine of the Trinity really becomes abundantly clear to us in the New Testament. Since we see the Trinity clearly in the New Testament, we can, with hindsight, look back and pick up on the Trinity in the Old Testament. And we could have addressed God being more than one person last week because the word translated God in Genesis 1-1 is Elohim, a plural noun used with a singular verb. But we will address that when we get to the creation of man, where God addresses himself as us. That's next week's study. The spirit of God is hovering in the darkness. Hovering means that there is movement. There is motion. There is activity. God's spirit is always involved in, in creation. God's spirit is always involved in in newness. God's spirit was hovering over the darkness of your hearts. If you're listening to this message and you have not yet been transformed by the power of the new birth, then God is hovering over the darkness in your heart. Verse 5, then God said, let there be light. And there was light. The first thing God created was light. God didn't create darkness. Darkness was already there. Darkness is the absence of light. Until God's spirit enters a person's heart because they have responded to his invitation to salvation in Christ Jesus, they remain in darkness. Verse 4, and God saw the light that it was good. Light is good. But not everyone loves light. 1 John 1, 5 says, This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. John 3, 19 through 21. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. I don't know why God just brought this to my mind. He's about to embarrass me. I don't want to see any hands. I don't want to embarrass you. Has anybody been in a strip club before? I know you have. It's dark in there, right? You've never been to a strip club with windows. It's dark. Because when you go in, you want darkness to hide that sin. Sin loves to live in darkness. The light exposes sin. And those coming to Jesus 
must be willing to humble themselves and admit that they are sinners. They must be willing to turn from their sin. This passage says that they hate the light because they love their darkness. They don't want their evil deeds to be exposed. You must be willing to humble yourself, realize that you are a sinner, and be willing to turn from your sin. I didn't say that you must turn from your sin. No one has the ability apart from Jesus to break the power of sin. But if you're willing to turn to God from your sin, believing that Jesus shed his blood for you, believing that the sacrifice of Jesus' blood on Calvary's cross and that he was buried in a tomb for three days and rose on the third day and then ascended into heaven and is sat on the right hand of God, having justified you by faith. If you can place your trust in Jesus and be willing to turn from your sin, then at that moment, God will give you the power to break the bond of sin in your life as he indwells you with his Holy Spirit. And then you will have victory to turn from sin. Light, darkness. Sin, righteousness. Verse 4, God saw the light and that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. That sounds familiar, right? You experience it every day of your life. You get light, and then you get dark, and then it's a new day. These are literal days. They're not epochs or ages of millions or billions of years as some purport. These are literal days. Light, day, darkness, night, evening, and morning. It could not be any more literal. A day is exactly <clears throat> what you think a day is, 24 hours. And it becomes even more clearer on day four, and we'll get there shortly. Verse 6, then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning was the second day. Now, this is not the heaven that we studied in Revelation, where God's throne is. The Bible tells us that there is a third heaven. So there's a second heaven and a first heaven. The third heaven is where God's throne is. This is speaking of the atmosphere, the first and the second heaven. Some commentators and scientists believe that this speaks of a significant water vapor blanket in the sky. Henry Morris of the Institute for Creation Research suggests several effects of a vapor blanket. It would serve as a global greenhouse, maintaining an essentially uniform, pleasant temperature over all the world. Without great temperature variations, there would be no significant winds, and the water rain cycle could not form any rain. No significant rain, and wind means no hurricane or tornadoes. There will be lush, tropical-like vegetation all over the world, fed not by rain, but by a rich evaporation and condensation cycle, resulting in heavy dew or ground fog. The vapor blanket will filter out ultraviolet radiation, cosmic rays, and other destructive energies bombarding the planet that cause a decrease in human Longevity. 
This is what a perfect world looks like. This is what God created. Also, the vapor blanket will provide the necessary reservoir for worldwide cataclysmic flood, which we will see in chapter 6, verse 9. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw it was good. The waters were covering the land until God gathered them in one place and the land appeared. This is when the earth was one land mass, something that scientists call Panagia. Some scientists believe that the earth was all one land mass. If you look at any world map, you can see how the continents look like jigsaw puzzle pieces that fit together. I agree with them concerning this, and I believe that the flood and which caused such great movement of the tectonic plates is what caused the continents to separate as they are now. The seas, the oceans, are also one. This is one of those things where critics of the Bible once criticized, but no longer. Critics says that Moses couldn't have been describing all of the water of the world. He must have been looking at only one sea. Well, Moses wasn't looking at any sea. Moses was simply recording what God had revealed to him. All the oceans we now know are connected. They really are one body of water. Verse 11, then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind. And the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. The third day is the beginning of life. God created living things that reproduce on the third day. A phrase that was repeated in this passage and that will continue to be repeated throughout the creation account is according to its kind. See, God allows for variation, but within the limits of one's kind. Evolutionists have always tried to sell the idea that one species can originate from an entirely different species. There has never been any evidence of that, ever, ever. Monkeys are still producing monkeys. None of them are turning into men. There is no missing link. Darwin himself said that if no transitional form, missing link, was found, then his theory was without merit. We need to go no further than Genesis, to know that his theory is without merit. Verse 14, then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Again, we see here very detailed and literal language. We see a great light to rule the day, obviously the sun, and a lesser light to rule the night, the moon. We see stars. Seasons, days, and years. This is literal. A day is a day, a week is a week, a year is a year. Verse 17, God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth 
and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. We're on the fourth day. Everything that God has made, God has declared good. God has created a beautiful and perfect world with lush and beautiful vegetation. God has created the beauty of the day and night with all of the heavenly bodies therein. Do you ever go outside and just marvel at God's creation? This world is not the perfect one that was originally created. It's changed because of sin. We, we no longer have a canopy in the sky protecting us. In Romans 8, 21 and 22 says, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. This world that we live on has been marred by sin. And it longs to be made new, just as we have been marred by sin and must ourselves be made new to avoid condemnation. But even in this fallen world, God's beauty exists everywhere in his creation. We see his hand when we look at our world. Psalms 19, 1 through 3. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. What a world. Yet, in our narrative, it's only the fourth day. The best is still yet to come. Verse 20. Then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Think of all the beautiful creatures of flight. Think of all the abundance of the beautiful creatures in the sea. God is so creative, so detailed, so glorious. I have to hand it to atheists. I don't think I could ever have the faith that they had. Faith in nothing. Faith in chance. To look at all the creatures that exist on earth and believe that it came from nothing requires more faith than I could ever muster. Or should I call it what it really is? Absolute foolishness. Foolishness. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Verse 22, and God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. This is the first we see a blessing from God in Scripture. Reproduction of living things is a blessing from God. There is no baby that is not a blessing from God. The psalmist said in Psalms 139, 13 and 14, because the creation itself also will be delivered. Ah, that's not the passage. Put it on the screen. <laughs> 
For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. God knows every child, even in the womb. The murder of an unborn child in the womb is sin. It is grotesque sin, and it is inexcusable. For any person to claim that they are a believer in Jesus Christ and advocate for the right to kill a child in the womb, you need to check your salvation. You need to check what you believe because it is grotesque sin. Now, I know that there are believers that have committed this sin, maybe before you were saved, maybe after you were saved. I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm condemning the act. There is no act, there is no sin where there isn't repentance and forgiveness by the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have committed this, I, I, I pray that you know today the love and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. But if you are one, if you're listening to me online, if you are one that is even contemplating killing your child because you have believed the lies of this world, if you are one who calls yourself a believer and, and say, can say, well, for me personally, I wouldn't do it, but I believe that, no. There is no right to kill what God has blessed, what God knows in the very womb. Repent and get right with God. Repentance and forgiveness can be yours. This is the God of life that we are looking at tonight. This is the God of creation. This is the God of love. This is the God who sent the third person of the Trinity, second person of the Trinity, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come and be born as a little baby to grow on this earth that he himself created. The Bible tells us that without Jesus, there was nothing made that was made. He came to this earth that we just read about, who he created, Jesus did, and he offered himself a sacrifice because I was a sinner, because I was born in sin in this world, and I chose of my own will and volition to remain a sinner and do my own thing, and so did you. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So if you're listening to me tonight, if you have got through the end of this Bible study, I want to invite you to meet this God, the God of creation, the God who gave his precious blood for you, I want to invite you to meet him tonight and never be the same, to be changed. All you need to do is, as I said earlier, be willing to turn from your sin. Are you willing to turn from your sin and allow God to be God in your life? Are you willing to allow the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Lord? I promise you, it's a decision you will never regret. You will have eternal life. You will have the God of the universe to fill your heart in the person of the Holy Spirit and to be with you and direct you throughout your days. And after you spend this short span of time on earth, you will spend a glorious eternity with him. Pray with me. Gracious God, come to you tonight and I am ready to surrender my life to you. I am ready to receive you as my Lord and Savior 
and experience the change that comes with being born again. I want to serve you, Lord. I know that I, I know of you and I've been acquainted with you, but I've never experienced what this pastor is talking about. I've never experienced a, a total transformation and change in my life. And I want that. I want you to be my Lord. So come into my heart and fill me now in your name. Saints of God, this is our God. Great, almighty God who rules in our hearts and who has directed us to represent him well. Lord Jesus, we thank you for who you are. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. Holy Spirit, we thank you for who you are. You are our God, and we surrender ourselves completely and totally to you. Use us for your glory in your name. Thank you. Amen. God bless you. Thank you all for being here. We'll, we'll continue our study in 1 Peter. Um, Sunday and please join us as we continue in Genesis again next Wednesday. God bless you and good night.